You know, that's just not fair, though. <laughs> I should have thought I should have thought about that last night. <laughs> my um, my coming in story is is actually very distinct to me. It's it really is a, a moment in time. Um, Jeff and I had moved here from Chicago in late 1989. We were watching what was going on with Louisville. We were new, um, on occasion going to board of aldermen meetings and. Um, we had watched what was going on in Chicago with their efforts when we were there. And both of us were active in the, the Pride Fair and some of that. And um, as many of you will remember at that time, and I know this is an overstatement, but it is so different from what it is now, very much, largely the women's community was very much the March for Justice, and the men's community was very much the Pride Fair. And looking back on it, it just seems so bizarre here 20 years later, but that's really so much of what it was. And so I remember the time, and I worked with Ken Herndon on the Pride Fair, and I remember at the time um, getting a call and saying, hey, Eric, there's this effort coming together. We're going to need an attorney plugged into it. Um, there's this woman I'd like you to meet named Carla Wallace. Would you like to, we'd like you to have lunch with us. It was at the restaurant downstairs at Actors Theater. It was probably in March or April of 1991. And I remember going to this lunch and I knew something was going to be proposed and I wasn't really sure what it was. You know, Ken had just said, just like to meet with you and talk with you a little bit about it. And, you know, those two, which should not surprise anyone, just had this amazing presentation. Um, I'm not sure how much of it was true at that very moment. <laughs> but I fell for it hook, line, and sinker. And I just thought, you know, this is an amazing thing. And, and still then, early in my legal career, now a little bit later, I just thought, this is going to be a fantastic thing to be a part of. And um, so said yes to it, could tell that it was going to be a terrific ride. A and the thing I, I'm very glad we passed the ordinance after those four times. I, I absolutely am. But there's something bigger there and, and everyone's referred to it already. And that is this community that came together and, and the men's and women's community and a kid from Southern Indiana learning about the African-American community in Louisville and being out on a picket and marching against, um, against police brutality in this community. I mean, there, there is a, a breadth that came about for this for so many people, and it's really you all. I mean, as Kate said, any one of you could be up here tonight because you have these stories too. It's, the ordinance is great, but there's something a lot greater there. There really is. So. How's everybody? Right. It's good to look out and see so many friends uh, for over the years and people that I've met. I guess when I think about it, I guess I was kind of born into it. <laughs> you know, I was born in 1950 in the West End of Louisville, and there was a time when segregation. We couldn't live here, we couldn't go to the libraries, we couldn't go to the parks, couldn't go to the movies, couldn't try on clothes, couldn't live here, couldn't have jobs. You know the story. You know, so we experienced, and Maddie knows good and well, we all experienced uh, racism and discrimination. So coming up to the 60s, uh, started getting open housing going, public accommodations, being able to eat at the Blue Boar, all those different things. So every struggle was a struggle, was a fight. So um, 67, I learned that it was a political process that was holding everything back because we could not get uh, the open housing ordinance passed by the Board of Aldermen. You know, the chambers were filled, we're getting thrown out of City Hall, down the steps, and you know, coming back for more, you know, because that was the right thing to do. You know, so after that, um, finally, we voted out some of the holdouts 
and voted in folks that were supportive. Next thing you knew, it passed. Okay, so I was like, wow. So then after that, I went to college, I went to law school, and, and came back to city government, and it was kind of like, okay, what do I do now? I want to stay involved in this kind of movement. So I became, uh, I worked in the law department. I uh, was the EEO coordinator. I helped write the city's first affirmative action plan. I was the affirmative action monitor. So I was working for those kind of things, you know, all my professional life. And then um, I left city government and I went to the state and I went to adult education. And then a friend of mine, Rhonda Richardson, urged me to come back to work for her as her legislative assistant. This was the summer of 1981. And she said, Sherry, I just don't want you to be my legislative assistant. She said, I want somebody that could be alderman, you know, that would have that kind of uh, uh, mentality and dedication to the job. And I was like, be alderman? Oh, no. You know, because I'm a kind of a, I thought I was anyway, a kind of a behind the scenes person. So it just fit me perfectly to work with Rhonda and she was really the chief sponsor of the uh, fairness fight with the Board of Aldermen. You know. you know, Rhonda was fearless. She was an attorney, she was articulate, she was knowledgeable, uh, she dressed well, she looked good, you know, she just had it all going on. You know, so I really admired her and we set up a lot of meetings. That's when I got to meet Carla, Pam, Eric. I got to meet everybody because Rhonda was having a lot of strategy meetings and things were going on and it was like, how are we going to get this passed? How are we going to get this going? Well, then she got, Melissa Marchand was the president of the Board of Aldermen at the time. So then she got with uh, Melissa and somebody had mentioned the fact about Paul and, uh, you know, so several months later, um, I don't know how much you want me to get into, but several months later, um, they thought they had Paul's vote. Paul had come out, had promised Carla and others that he was going to be, if it got to be, a seventh vote. Because, you know, with 12 aldermen, you needed seven to uh, get it passed. Well, Paul worked at the Bank of Louisville, <laughs> and I don't know what pressure came to bear, but he, he made a statement like, you know, I, I don't know what, in other words, what got into me? I, I don't intend to support this. So it really set it back, you know, and it was like another eight years later before we were able to get it passed. But at that time, I was the legislative assistant in 1981. And then, ni I mean, 1991, thank you. Not that old. 1991 and then uh, 1992. I was the clerk of the Board of Aldermen, so then I had another behind the scene role, but I was able to, you know, maneuver whatever I had to do to help facilitate the passage. And then, um, so it was just exciting. It was exciting. And I felt like I was on the right side of doing everything. So, um, 2000, well, 1999, I guess, was when, um, you know, Alderman had two year terms. So you knew that. You could get them out two years, you know, like not like our Metro Council, there's four years, but on the Board of Aldermen, so it was like, okay, we can bide our time. So I think it was right after that first time it did not pass, Project Fair Vote yes. was, was brought about by the Fairness Campaign. And it was kind of like, okay, <laughs> we know how to work this game as well. So um, just watching that get started and all the political maneuverings, and like you said about police brutality, every time it was something, the coalition was bigger than just race or gender or whatever. It was progressives, it was people fighting for the right thing, you know, so we just kept joining and people you look over and we're supporting each other on all kind of things. So um, I'll stop now, but um, Thank you. Thank you.